With increasing awareness of biodiversity loss in wild and domesticated flora, and the disruption of ecological communities, humankind's treatment of and beliefs about plants have become a major topic in environmental disciplines. Just decades past, scientists, philosophers, and scholars alike began to approach the climate crisis through a multidisciplinary lens, acknowledging not only the faults and feats of technology and science and their subsequent solutions in environmental regard, but also those of morality. This perspective, evident in areas of knowledge such as environmental ethics, ethnobotany, and plant intelligence, assumes our climate crisis as a moral issue that is therefore in need of a moral solution. Ethnobotany, the study of a region's plants and their uses through traditional function and knowledge defined by the region's people, provides a context for the differing relationships with the natural world varied by culture. This somewhat novel concept of plant intelligence, on the other hand, should first and foremost be explicitly disclosed as an intelligence of a different nature than the one we've commonly understood. Yet, not as different as one may presume. This documentary will explore these two areas of knowledge, plant intelligence and ethnobotany, inextricably woven in how they represent the interconnection of life and humanity's physical, emotional, and spiritual dependencies on the flora we so righteously monopolize for our own sake, despite any future detriment. Based on the long-term association of knowledge and consciousness with the brain in both the societal and scientific collective, plants are not often considered intelligent nor conscious, as they don't have a brain like animals do. However, recent science suggests the contrary, despite their lack of cerebral matter. A series of recent studies in literature spanning from the late 20th century has indicated that plants are of the ability to learn, record, and evaluate in their own adaptive, communicative, and reactive nature and not through evolution in a species' DNA over generations, but in behavior covering months, weeks, even days. Much like ourselves. Take Dr. Monica Gagliano's research, for example. In testing whether a plant could remember and learn from new experiences and flexibly alter their behavior, she performed multiple experiments to find whether a plant could stop reacting in an automatic and predetermined manner to a disturbance that initially seemed like a threat, but quickly proved not to be of any harm, with a mechanism consisting of a vertical steel rail and a cup fit for a single potted plant. This mechanism would perform a drop at a constant rate every 5 seconds from a height of 15 centimeters, a total of 60 times per session, slow enough not to damage the studied plant, Mimosa pudica, but fast enough to trigger the rapid closure of the leaves. This rapid closure of Mimosa she describes is a survival reflex, a crucial one to understand as an exorbitant living expense, a justifiable one to pay if the danger is real, but a waste of precious opportunity to forage for light and thrive when a situation turns out not to be dangerous at all. She found after four to six drops, the plants stopped folding their leaves and would even stop closing altogether on the first drop during successive sessions as the day progressed. To test whether these results were examples of Mimosa's ability to learn, remember, and adjust behavior, and not just a reflection of exhaustion, she changed the disturbance mechanism to one of an unfamiliar nature, a vibrating plate, and found the same 56 plants folded their leaves. To strengthen her evidence of the plant's conscious memory, she then returned the plants to their original drop mechanism and found the same leaves remained open, concluding the plant was not only able to recognize and respond to stimulus, while remaining responsive to new potentially threatening stimuli, but also had the faculty of memory. Apropos to ethnobotany, 
Plant intelligence and one's belief regarding such provokes questions such as, should we emphasize life's interdependency and environmental education? Should we regard plants as having their own intrinsic right to legal protection as opposed to solely regarding such for their economic and resource value? Should indigenous peoples have legal rights to protection, possession, and use of traditionally used plants? And of course, would these applications enable society to live more sustainably as a result of personal worldviews? The past year, I sought the similarities or differences between perspectives on plant intelligence and the natural world as they're individually defined by sustainable farmers and indigenous peoples through questionnaire and discussion, along with helpful insight from related figures met throughout the process. There are particular caveats to which one doing research, including any demographic foreign to their own, should absolutely be considered and addressed. I'd like to preempt further explanation with a quote from my professor, Dr. Christiana Zinner, from her book, Just Water, in which she states, It can be dangerous when the spur to recognition of pluralistic value systems comes from a centralized patriarchal authority that is historically associated with colonialism and universalism and normatively expounded by predominantly white scholars in the Northern Hemisphere. In research involving indigenous knowledge and methodology so often plagued with the complex of the white savior, it's necessary to acknowledge the diversities within indigeneity, the multitude of indigenous nations that make up our continents, and the countless tribes and clans that make up these nations. It's necessary to reject procedures which reinscribe historical harm, appealing to inclusion that really doesn't involve ultimate determinable say by subject. It's necessary to stand in epistemic solidarity and not speak for anybody providing stories nor answers, but by providing perspectives. As sustainable farming is known to often be a reworking of traditional agricultural systems native to indigenous groups, I wondered if these similarities or differences in perspectives of those renowned for earth-based traditions worldviews, and environmentally sustainable action would speak for the significance, or lack thereof, of a blurring line between humanity and nature in ecological salvation. Before jumping in, I have the opportunity to present a perspective from a founding member of Bioneers, a nonprofit promoting solutions for restoring the planet like restorative food systems, biomimicry, indigeneity, and women's and youth leadership. Jeffrey Bronfman, also Mestre for the Uniao do Vegetal, a religious group founded in 1961 in Brazil, which melts traditional Christian theology with indigenous beliefs and greatly centers around the taking of ayahuasca from the ayahuasca vine and shakuna shrub. What, what is your perspective on that notion that plants have an intelligence of their own in which they're able to record and learn and adapt their behavior? Um, and also particularly the notion that they're conscious. Unquestionably, all of creation is alive. All of nature is alive. And, and the degree to which intelligence is imbued throughout nature throughout the natural world is something that is something that I've known for a while and something that through my own life path of working with it I've I've gained greater knowledge and uh, I see it more holistically mm -hmm. not like if you have two plants side by side that you could measure the intelligence of one versus the intelligence of the, the other yeah the intelligence is in nature herself mm -hmm. and the plants are different plants serve different functions but they're all expression of the same spiritual force, which is nature herself. One of the challenges is this view of nature as a commodity. To know that this is us, that this matters, this isn't some, somebody else in some other part of the world. This is our home, that we need to come and unite and care for it together mm -hmm. and not look what we or our country or our class or our, you know, whatever can benefit from it at somebody else's expense, but completely reordering our way of being where 
the wealthy person is the one who has um, given the most, mm. not the one who's taken the most. Yeah, I. it's just, it's so heartbreaking and it's just blasphemous to know that as a majority, like humanity really views the natural world as resource for our own pr profit and our own um, priorities. And that's just, it's so disrespectful and it is destructive to ourselves as well. You use the word blasphemy and it's like a poverty, a poverty of, of not understanding our place and so consequently miss perceiving it. And, and, and it's also been happening with the sacred plants, you know, where, where now there's people who've discovered these plants and they want to use it as a way of, you know, selling them or elevating themselves or, you know, going to these ceremonies where, you know, people are charged, you know, hundreds of dollars and, and the person who's doing these things is enriching themselves. And, and where's the commitment to, mm. you know, the earth and where's the commitment to mm -hmm. the cultures that brought them, you know, forward to that point. So yeah. it's a delicate thing. And, and I think that the, this view of, of, um, the material world and how we profit from it and what we take from it. And, and the idea of taking without giving something back is something really foreign to the cultures that live closer to the earth. And so I think that these are principles that the plants teach us how to live in right relationship with one another, how to live in right relationship with nature, how to live in right relationship to the celestial realms and how to be a true human. I think that this is what the, the plants teach us. And as a true human, what's our relationship to the animals? What's our relationship to other human beings? What's our relationship to the earth? Yeah, reciprocity seems to be a key theme that is just coming up over and over and over again. Yeah, and that, that brings me on to my next question. You guys ultimately became one of the first entities to be granted the authority to import that, um, a Schedule One controlled substance for religious use. Do you think that these benefits provided by these entheogens such as peyote, ayahuasca, psilocybin should be available to the public or solely to those um, in government recognized established religious entities? Well, I think that there's different levels to that question. And I'm not sure if the government is necessarily the right uh, entity that should be certifying uh, who should do that or not. It, it's been a whole study for me, a relationship of what the right relationship is between government um, securing our freedoms and then government at times interfering with our freedoms. And it's uh, the area of religion is a very you know, long and interesting story. It's the current model of um, drug in the, in the way that they see it, um, uh, the model that the government has in terms of authorizing uh, psychoactive substances is there's either this idea of it needs to be prohibited or it needs to be open for everybody. Yeah. And I think that the real intelligence is somewhere in between. Mm -hmm. How could we develop uh, protocols in place that's not just open for everyone where it could be abused, but also not prohibited? My view is absolutely it shouldn't be just open for everybody. Mm -hmm. There needs to be um, methods by which people could be trained and execute responsibly and standards of review and and accountability, I think, is really important. Yes, and, and, and reciprocity and, and mm -hmm. giving back to the communities where these, you know, sacred instruments come from. Just like you were saying, people... So many people now that um, all these ayahuasca treats are coming about, they're using these medicines uh, for profit. And yeah. the, it can definitely be abused, even in the recreational sense, where there may be good intention going into it, but without the traditional respect and understanding of the teachings and how... how really importantly how to integrate those teachings it can easily be abused and uh disrespected so I, I agree with you on that what particularly was it about these entheogens that made it of a seemingly different sacred nature 
Was it their alkaloids, such as dimethyltryptamine found in ayahuasca, and others found in psilocybin and peyote, for example? Were these plants of a different intelligence than others? It's the whole synergy of the plant yeah. itself. Yeah. Take that one element and extract it and say, this is, you know, what's really interesting to mm -hmm. me. No, it's you're the, discrediting the spirit. Oh, plants aim to be on this earth in relationship to one another. And how it was discovered that if you put two plants together like this, I, I assure you it wasn't through trial and error. There's been an identification that there are certain compounds, dimethyltryptamine, harmine, mm -hmm. harmaline, and, and, and so there are people have the idea that, that uh, that's the synergy that creates the um, uh, awakened state of consciousness. And people try to simulate that with other plants or, you know, there's a, a, a pharmawaska. Like your synthetic bunker, DMT. Uh, synthetic DMT mm -hmm. and, and, and harmine and harmaline and... and you know, in my view, that's not the same as, as deriving what nature, because we may be able to identify certain compounds or alkaloids mm -hmm. and think, well, that's what it is. And maybe there's all kinds of synergistic, invisible elements to the fact that these are living spirits, mm. you know, plants that are not just, you know, the, the reductionist view of, oh, it's this molecule and mm -hmm. this molecule. Mm -hmm. No, these are living systems and they're connected to the place where they grow and they're connected perhaps to other plants that are in symbiotic relationship to them. And that whole realm of knowledge and, and mystical discovery is something that is eliminated when you treat it as a commodity yeah. and, and a material thing. There are natural laws that we need to respect and cultures that are working to live in harmony with those laws, laws that need to be respected, and that we're here on this earth to learn about relationship, not about exploitation. So we got a long way to go. Yeah, definitely. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. And so further insight was gathered from various states such as Colorado, New Mexico, and various indigenous and climate organizations. So what did the questionnaire results have to say? For the first claim, plants are conscious, 100% of both indigenous peoples and sustainable farmers agreed. For the second, the same results showed. As for the third, 85% of sustainable farmers agreed while 100% of indigenous peoples did. And for the fourth, both 85% of both groups agreed. Lastly, 85% of indigenous peoples agreed, while 100% of sustainable farmers agreed. These results reflect that the majority support the notions of plant intelligence and have a deep connection to and concern for their environment. Now, due to the small population pool and little variety in response, and a subject as broad and intimate as relation to the natural world, first-hand experience and perspective is deserving. And so we begin in luscious and utopic Applegate Valley of Southern Oregon, in a farm called Sun Spirit, ripe with dewy life and optimistic certainty in collective regeneration. Uh, well, I guess that would start with um, me growing up in New Hampshire in like a rural area. In school, like, you know, in addition to like history and math and all that, we'd they would like kind of teach you like how to not die. You learned a whole lot of uh, respect for the for the elements too, and I guess that's always fascinated me and, and wanted me to to learn more about nature. You were forced to have some of a connection to it. You couldn't ignore it mm -hmm. like you can quite easily in a city. Oh yeah, oh yeah, it's it's totally another world. We have a particular kind of intelligence, but uh, plants have a different type of intelligence as well, you know. Plants can, because of the photospheres uh, that they use uh, to harvest the sun, they can see you standing next to them and even what color shirt you're wearing. Whoa, you know? so, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and they communicate with uh, the microbes and the mycorrhizal fungi mm -hmm. with uh, sugar signatures. So the plant says, I want some boron, and it will send down a sugar signature and tell the microbes of fungi to go out and get boron, and the boron 
will, the, the mycorrhiza fungi will harvest a freaking rock for the boron and bring it back to the plant. You know, so amazing. You know, yeah. uh, and uh, you know, in the forest you have mother trees, and these mother trees are connected to all the other trees in the forest. You know, and and. and they watch out for each other. Uh, they did a test of carbon-14, which is a radioactive uh, 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 element. And they injected one tree uh, that was needing carbon, and they injected the mother tree with carbon, seeing how long it would take for this other tree to uptake this carbon, and it took seconds. They, they live in a cooperative system, you know, just like all these plants and all these bugs and all these fungi and microbes. They, they're all cooperative with each other but they harvest each other as well, you know? So, uh, 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 and our societies were built around this cooperative system, you know, because uh, we, because us as Native uh, people uh, uh, still pay attention to our original medicine bundle. And the medicine bundle uh, tells us that our elder relatives, that's what we call them, uh, known as animals and plants and stuff, uh, they have a wisdom uh, uh, with them that uh, we are too stupid to understand, you know. So uh, a lot of times the wisdom is uh, carried uh, in the forms of their bodies, you know, and how they are able to uh, do the jobs that they do that keeps us alive because absolutely everything that we have, food, air, water, clothing, shelter, comes from our elder relatives, that sacred biodiversity out there. Our women were the gardeners in our societies, you know. Um, because they took care of the earth, you know, and so all the growing things and everything, you know. And our, our women used to uh, take the seeds and they used to uh, put them in their mouths before they planted them. And they're giving them the, the seeds their DNA, you know, when they do that, you know. So you're making relationships with these plants, you know, that they, they used to sleep with them, uh, the seeds, and they used to sing with the seeds, sing to the seeds too, as they're planting, you know. So take your time, take your time, uh, come when you're ready, you know. So words of one of the songs, you know, and so uh, uh, they, they took care of them uh, knowing that the power in the seed is uh, uh, amazing, you know, I mean, so, I mean, you've seen cod leaves of squash, you know, I mean, all that, all that is in the seed, yeah. you know, it hasn't harvested anything from the soil or anything yet. Creation is not just from the perspective that certainly holds in both of the indigenous and the Sephardi perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, creation is the tangible body of creator. And that body goes all the way it's into strange. particle physics and Higgs bosons. Mm -hmm. That's that's how how you know, omnipresent or whatever, mm -hmm. that consciousness is, but it longs to embrace humankind all the time. The birds, the songs of the birds, the food that comes out of the ground, mm -hmm. the beautiful beauty of the atmosphere, yeah. the, the color of the sky, all of these things are longings that the Creator you know, has to be in deeper and deeper and deeper uh, sensual, conscious, spiritual, philosophical levels with all of creation, including, of course, humankind. Creation gives you the opportunity to conscientiously cocoon with it. Yeah. It, to be in cocoon with it. Spirituality is a generally a cerebral construct, a model mm -hmm. of the metaphysics, some rat passing the metaphysics of the universe, and then you come up with dogmas or whatever, you know, to, to guide you or direct you. All you have to do is engage with creation tactfully. And that's why gardening, and that's why, you know, you, you look at the iconography of the whole thing, at the garden, I mean, mm -hmm. the, the entry point for human consciousness to begin to, to em embrace creation, the result of which is food. The regenerative agriculture is about as completely embracing that cycle to where there are no broken pieces, you know, there, there's no like hazardous material storage area for your gasoline and, and all the other hazardous material, and that's King's X for the regenerative lifestyle. 
whenever um, I have something I'm trying to, to figure out or um, I'm trying to choose a path to go on, I always just try to observe nature. I believe that uh, these like patterns and systems and courses, like in our lives, are, are mimicked in nature or you know vice versa. Um, so, yeah, when I try to figure out like what's what's right from wrong for me, I just kind of go and immerse myself in the woods and just watch the system kind of play out. Yeah, I love that. I love the concept of nature being a teacher and like openly accepting that. It's the study of this earth that we get to learn about the creator. My community feels that uh, the natural environment is uh, um, spirituality uh, in physical form. Uh, because creator uh, uh, made this, you know, and we don't have a, a male god, you know, uh, we, have, uh, we don't have a female god, uh, we have a great mystery. And so uh, because a male god allows women to be subserviated and allows the earth to be raped, mutilated, all that stuff, you know. One of my elders said, there's a wave out there, and that wave is the same wave as our brain wave. It, so when we get out there, we're aligning with that, you know. Mm -hmm. So when we come into cities, uh, electromagnetic, uh, chaos, uh, pollution, uh, we get all messed up in with our brain waves. It seems like a lot of people, when they're in crisis, they turn to God in the sky, you know, to solve all their problems. And maybe they're looking in the wrong places. Like maybe all the answers are in the soil beneath their feet, and in themselves, and in each other, and all around them. Well, that's the thing, you know. It's like uh, these books, the Torah, the Bible, the Quran. You know, they they govern societies. You know, mm -hmm. but uh, uh, what governs life? You know, that's what's sacred. Once you know you leave the farm or whatever it is, you know you go out into the world. It's it's simply returning back to you know something that that is a, that's that's a normal. normal existence. Yeah, and so many people don't have that. It's like exactly. people born into exactly. cities, they don't have that chance to really right. connect. And it, it, it's not just there. Is part of, of that whole system is understanding how totems work. How how. Uh, the actual energy and consciousness of of the way that a given animal or, or even plants are resonates with part of, of our character, and that's why in every religion or, or indigenous religion you see or uh, you know way of life, mm -hmm. you see that they that 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 you find resonance with certain guilds in the environment. And they work as guides. In Western culture, those, those totems are automobiles and sports teams and all sorts of crazy stuff. Mm -hmm. And all of that stuff works really, really hard to distract you from the real guiding totems in the world. And each one of those totems is, is an is a, uh, invitation to engage you know, in, in a commonality with the rest of creation. Yeah. So creation is constantly inviting us into it. And it's something like that brings us back to what we first yeah. were talking about, something you can't own, something you can't buy. It's a completely separate entity, yeah. that separate life. Yeah. When we harvest a plant, uh, we call it, we, we make a sacrifice, we make an offering. You know, a lot of times that offering is tobacco and there's a reason why it's tobacco is because tobacco uh, carries a, a sacrifice in it and it carries potential in it. When I say a prayer for my sister because she has the flu, I'm opening up a conduit between myself, the creator, my sister, the earth and myself into the cause effect field out there, which one of my elders said. Uh, so that when you harvest something from it, something fills it up. When you put something in it, something comes out, you know, it stays balanced. No good deed goes unpunished has a basis in con uh, natural law, you know, uh, is that you pay for something, you know, because everything's balanced, you know. The tobacco blocks that, you know, oh. so so because of the sacrifice in the tobacco, yeah, you know. Yeah. So I'm able to pay a uh, pray without having to pay for my prayer. Uh huh. Physically, I understand. You know? So there's a constant like reciprocal relationship. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 
and that's the problem with today. And that's why uh, uh, we haven't uh, uh, developed a culture here in America because culture springs from the land, you know. And uh, it's like uh, the desert people, they have their culture, which is different than the plains people or the woodland natives, you know, completely different cultures, you know. So because of the land that they live in, you know. So that's why America uh, uh, didn't develop a culture because they've been separated from the land. Shoot, this might actually be three, but um, to, to first break our addiction to like disposable items in the first place. Two, any plastic products that we have, we should be growing, you know, because there's plenty of... of what do you mean by that? There's plenty of ways ways to make plastic out of, like, plants, mm -hmm. like you know. Hemp. Yeah, hemp is a fantastic example. It's very high-yielding and can, like, you can bring it down to a price to be competitive with uh, uh, petrochemical plastics. Mm -hmm. um, Rise Up, the bakery here in the valley that does really good. I realized yesterday that they're, the bags that they put their bread in are made out of eucalyptus and are compostable. What? Yeah. That's sick. So there's all these options. And to kind of piggyback that into my third one is uh, the reason I got into farming in the first place was to combat climate change. First off, everyone's got to eat. Yeah. We understand that and we know most people these days don't want to grow their own food. Depending on, you know, whose statistic you look at, like between 20 and 50 percent of greenhouse emissions are from agriculture. Uh, you know, agriculture is a human invention and I don't think it necessarily has to be um, a bad thing. I think I think it can it can help sequester carbon if done the correct way. Mm -hmm. I think um, it can help bring communities together. It helps provide people their own independence because they could just <coughs> generate and grow from their land and what they have, you know. And know how it's being done. I feel like you have more respect okay. for it. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, that, that in and of itself, like the respect you learn for the land there, makes you think about every action you take. And it leaves you a lot of time to ponder. You know? Yeah, so much time to think. Yeah, so it, it, it feeds my soul. We can't do things on these big scales. Like, we need to scale it back and then scale up the number of farms if we're going to provide this, you know. You could still provide the same the same yields if you, like, take the effort in, you yeah. know, and you end up saving costs in the long run because nature is generous. It's not necessarily industrial agriculture that is the problem but is like what how they do it you know what i mean so like you can still be sustainable or regenerative even on an, a, a larger scale absolutely and that would be ideal i i'd love it if we could talk more about soil's role in balancing the climate uh -huh. and what you and anna are doing with nourishing systems so for every single time we go through the tremendous climate changes that are always occurring. Within written, human written history, the mini ice age and all those things, the climate is, is bobbing all over the place. And one of the things that bobs around in it is carbon dioxide. Mm -hmm. And it turns out, and we've, you know, on a regular basis, you know, been up above uh, twice what our CO2 levels are now. And what, what happens is, a lot of stuff uh, goes extinct or becomes really, really small, and a lot of other stuff really, really goes crazy. Mm -hmm. And what really, really goes crazy are the leaders in nature, the fungi. Mm -hmm. When we have one of these big changes in, in the climate, particularly around carbon dioxide, uh, for instance, it gets up to above uh, 400, uh, well, really around 500, and suddenly, all these uh, trees and forests shrink back. Mm -hmm. And suddenly what you have are these grasslands full of grasses that are crazy with uh, uh, mycory mycorrhizae called glomaria. And they are so unbelievably efficient at stimulating the growth of these grasses 
to suck in so much carbon dioxide and turn it into root exudate. We want to protect ecologies, which is what I think is a really good idea. And what we're doing in the yard, for instance, is replacing as many grasses with forbs as we possibly can. Because the climate is pushing it, pushing them into the background. Mm -hmm. And so if you just make minor changes in your microclimate, just upping the amount of moisture, that, things like that, then the forbs kind of hang in there. In Amazonia, there was a culture of people that carry out very large scale agriculture. And uh, they have these soils that's called Terra Preta de los Indias. And um, it's this black soil mm -hmm. that has vastly more carbon in it than anybody. And, and it's obviously human made. Mm -hmm. And you find it in, in um, what looked like walkways or causeways, I guess you'd say. Well, what they were, they were trenches. Mm -hmm. and, and it's true, you do, do find charcoal in there because if they often would put it in there because it's pretty close. Mm -hmm. But mainly, it was this process, okay. fossilizing biology. Uh, particularly, real biochar is extremely good at holding on to nutrients and keeping them from leaching away. Mm -hmm. And so when something dies, yeah. its nutrient sticks to particularly this biochar. It turns out that, that uh, charcoal that you bury, mm -hmm. It does grab onto uh, those materials really, really well. That's why they have activated charcoal filters for pulling stuff out of water. Mm. The thing is, it doesn't give it back. Mm. It goes into these cyclic compounds and it gets lodged in there. So the nutrient cycling that comes out of charcoal is a fraction of what comes out of biochar. Yeah. Because what they are, they're sheets as opposed to rings. And the rings will hold onto something in the ring. And the sheets simply give it a place to, to lay down for a minute before it moves on. One foot layer of these guys. And so there's lots and lots of pore space in between them. There's, they're hollow, but they're full of... So there's an enormous amount of uh, surface area mm -hmm. in that volume. Okay, and then you compost mm -hmm. over that. Okay, so, and then on the top uh, of the um, trench, you put in ramial, freshly chopped ramial wood. What will happen is the fun fungi, garden oyster mushrooms are the main one, just completely fill the uh, uh, ramial wood chips. Oh my gosh. Oh yeah, it's just like white fuzz. Cool. Like <laughs> and, and it goes off into the soil on either side of, of the trench. With all that hyphae growing in there, all of the uh, composting that's going on down here, oh, all the gases okay. stay down yeah. in here. Okay, so down in, inside these sticks, you have critters that generate carbon dioxide, but they don't generate much methane and they don't generate much ammonia. Mm -hmm. And they don't much, uh, generate much sulfur dioxide, mm -hmm. the stinky things in anaerobic systems. But they do produce a lot of carbon dioxide. And that's the, as they're breaking everything down, they're turning it into the constituent parts of you know, things that decompose into a lot of lignin, chitin, uh, uh, glomalin, that sort of thing, stuff that keeps the, the, the carbon in the soil mm -hmm. and in really, really, really dense long chain molecules. So there's a lot of carbon each in, in each individual molecule. So as, as that occurs, this, the level of the, the air on the inside of, of the stalks gets up well above 900 parts per million. Mm -hmm. Once it gets above 670 parts per million, glomaria wake up in the soil and they start filling any um, root system that, that's available to it. So what happens is the fungal community shifts to a new fungal community, just like it has every single time the Earth has gone through one of these episodes. All we're doing is employing the very system that evolved over a billion years to take care of climate change. That's and it does incredible, and it's done so over and over. I mean, thousands of times it's been through this cycle. Once that CO2 get, uh, gets up there, the, the glomaria go crazy, uh -huh. and they start secreting glomalin. Okay. And this is a glomalin sponge. Okay. So glomalin is a very, very a, a carbon rich molecule and it's really large mm -hmm. and it doesn't break down very easily. When you have things like glomalin 
uh, seeping out into the soils, if they have the right substrate, they can basically petrify organic material, but instead of, instead of turning it into silica stone, oh. it turns it into coal. This will fossilize into a piece of coal. They're proteins and they will polymerize. So this piece of guamelin connects with this piece of guamelin and to the next and the next. And they, they start making these sheets mm -hmm. of, of, of carbon-rich organic material. Well, every time that, that they uh, glue onto each other, they exclude all the air and everything else that's between them. So in, you end up with a layer mm -hmm. that is more than 60% carbon. Because if you're cycling out of geology and taking it over and putting it into the air horizon of the soil. That process has been going on, le largely led by fungi, for a billion and a half years. Mm -hmm. It works really well, <laughs> you know? And it's so easy to do. It yeah. does not require factories or drilling rigs or fracking operations. All yeah. it requires is people with the with the right skills. This has been done 5,000 years ago. Is there like a specific group that Terra this Preta. is? Terra Preta. Terra Preta. Yeah. And there, I learned, everybody I knew learned those skills at 10, mm -hmm. the age of 10. They're not like, it's not calculus, you know, it's just the way of really the way what of it is, it's, it's getting into an indigenous state of mind in which you're listening to everything that's going on in, in the garden and creation around you. That's Takuma. In our culture, we have a circle with a cross in it, and that represents uh, all kinds of things. That represents uh, the four directions, it represents uh, the, the stone, the water, the animal, the earth, or uh, the, the plant. It represents uh, the equinoxes, the solstices, it represents the emotional, it represents uh, the, the cycles of life from the youth to adolescence to uh, adult to old person again. It represents many, many things. Uh, in uh, uh, Europe, uh, during the process of civilization, which is actually a process of colonization, is that they uh, uh, took away the circle from the cross, okay? So what is that circle? That circle is the earth. The best example is uh, the Inquisition of Spanish Inquisition. 500 years of uh, abusing, maiming, torturing, raping, killing, flaying people of earth-based cultures and, and making them love what they feared, which totally messed them up in the head, you know. And it, it caused what we see as a fear gene, as Native Americans, as a fear gene, and that uh, uh, when you have this fear gene, it robs you of your critical thought. So this critical thought process is what the government uses uh, uh, the lack of critical thought to push your buttons, the fear buttons that, that uh, you've inherited through epigenetics. Yeah. So uh, uh, so most people have have a uh, uh, have this fear gene, and so they're easily controlled. You know, it's like when you see the government quoting scripture, that's when you know they're heavily pushing that fear button. You know? So uh, uh, us uh, as natives, uh, we have the latest take on colonization, the nicer term civilization, you know? So uh, we don't think civilization is a good thing, you know? We think decentralized agrarian societies with food as the economy, with leadership equal with both men and women, but preferably the women, you know, that to, to lead, you know? Um, especially right now, you know, is what needs to happen. We are in an unrecoverable situation. This is unrecoverable. You cannot. So even if uh, we were able to stop CO2, all this other stuff is going on. The poisoning of the earth, the microplastics, moving up the food chain, poisoning our future generations. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 what I think is the best thing that we could do uh, is to become powerful in our prayer because I've seen what you would call miracles you know I've seen a man get up and walk out of a sweat lodge for been in a wheelchair 17 years my mom uh, transported across the room in a ceremony uh, my cousin golf ball size cancer reduced down to the size of a pea they call it spontaneous healing I've seen things that I know uh, uh, can happen 
because this world is a great mystery. Yeah. You know? And so when we become powerful with our prayer, as human beings, when we shake this uh, colonization that uh, has been forced on us, uh, uh, spoon-fed to us, that we will be able to, I don't know, uh, uh, like in our stories, uh, they have a saying, you know, it says, uh, before we re receive a great medicine, like the pipe or tobacco, there's a saying that says the people had lost their way, and we're right there right now. I, I think that we are in a learning phase right now, uh, and it's going to be a really tough learning phase because many people are going to die because cat. Uh, catastrophes are coming. Yeah. You know, so uh, the best thing that we can do is learn about this earth, become powerful with our prayer. Yeah. And I hope you have a uh, um, saying basically uh, uh, that there was uh, four medicine bundles uh, handed down. One is uh, the first one was uh, the yellow medicine bundle or the black medicine bundle, which was the water medicine bundle, so the origin of life. You know? And the second medicine bundle was the yellow medicine bundle. Uh, and uh, that was the wind medicine bundle. And all these came with ways of praying and ways of respecting and get along with the earth and everything, you know, uh, uh, and govern your societies. And, and uh, then the third medicine bundle was the fire medicine bundle, which, the, which was the white medicine bundle, which is the age we're at right now, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, and uh, so, and then the fourth medicine bundle is the uh, earth medicine bundle. That's the red medicine bundle. That's where the indigenous peoples from around the world will bring their cultures, their ways to share with the rest of the world to show them a way to live, you know, so that's, is coming up. So we have a purification coming up first, you know, so uh, right now we're in a learning lesson. Uh, some people are going to learn the hard way, some people are going to die, you know, yeah. so I mean, it's a, uh, Things going to get bad, then they're going to get really terrible, oh, yeah. and at the end, people will uh, uh, join up under the tree of life and become one family. And we'll have a thousand years peace after that. So, uh, I come from uh, 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 prophecies, you know. Uh, so, I, I, I'm aware of all the things that have already happened. You know, like right now, one of the things that tells us a sign is that uh, the trees will start dying from the top down. And uh, uh, you will tell, uh, by the way, the tree, people treat their children, you know. And so, Yemen, 20,000 kids, you know, Palestine, you know, I mean, the, the border, you know, I mean, it's just, we're treating kids terribly, you know. So, it's coming, but uh, the past is our future, the future is our past, and uh, we're going to return to a beautiful way, you know. And so, the more we learn about how to create a good society and how to grow food, the better we're going to be. We have to go into this with the knowledge mm -hmm. that our actions are going to be have a, a positive outcome. That's not hope. That's a knowing. That's a thinking, you know, because when we say believe, all of, everything uh, goes away. Mm -hmm. All our power goes away because we're believing something. Mm -hmm. We're not thinking something. Mm -hmm. you not know? knowing. Right, right. It's like uh, uh, we're, we're reacting because we haven't developed a response. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. so that's, we can believe that we're not separate, you know, because it's impossible for anybody to be separate, you know. So we're all deeply, deeply connected, you know. Uh, and it's the separation that the colonizers want us to believe because it brings us off balance as human beings, as powerful human beings. Because we have, we are power as human beings. They are violent authority. Mm -hmm. That's the difference. Before any of this can change, yeah. we have to decolonize. Mm -hmm. You know, and how do we do that? That's that's an unknown road. Natives, we have a unique. Uh, I'm saying so. We are closing about five minutes. Okay. All right. Thanks for letting us know. Unique perspective on colon colonization because we were the last to be colonized. Mm -hmm. You know, so yeah. my people like 500 plus years. You know. The white people for thousands of years, you know, so it's a lot to uh, deconstruct and reconstruct. You have a country, you have a bunch of countries, mm -hmm. whose entire food crop is based on huge machinery mm -hmm. and lots and lots of petroleum. Mm -hmm. Well, there are lots of things that can happen to break that 
the chain. I mean, their political climate, uh, you know, one good solar flare to rest your entire economic and political system on such a dicey situation, it's going to come to an end. Just taking it in, just coming into that relationship with the land and people on the land and that peace and serenity that, that people share when they're doing that, it's the most important thing we could possibly do. I think that's a big uh, point to make is um, of how much cooperation there is in nature despite how brutal it can be. You know, because ultimately everything is recycled. You know, and just it's it's helped me let go of a lot of my materialism and uh, and how to learn respect for like any kind of form of life. Even if I may be harming it, like popping a fucking squash beetle or you know, ripping a weed out of the ground and recognizing its divinity. It wasn't like that. It was like they were That's about right. it. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> okay, there was a. Uh, uh, conservatives had an encephalogram put on their brain to map their brain as they were thinking, you know? They were given a high stakes problems with a high reward solution, and that's a critical thought problem, you know? When they did that, uh, their amygdala lit up, and that's their fight or flight. Lizard brain, uh, uh, fear-based uh, area, yeah. you know, uh, and so when the non-conservatives did it, their cortex and their parietal lobe lit up, you know, that's a critical thought in their emotional problem solving, you know, so so that's two different brains thinking on the same problem, different parts of their brain lit up. So that's why I think conservatives don't think critically, is because when they do that. Their critical thought is is centered in their fear neural web, so it causes them suffering. Yeah. You know, so they don't think critically. So, oh so what you have also, so then that what you have is I'm thinking, and I think I'm thinking. There's a lot of people in the I think I'm thinking phase all day, all the time. They lack critical thought. They don't want to think critically. You know, so they're in the th I think I'm thinking phase. Unfortunately, we don't only have a few more minutes left, but I'd love to offer you a chance to say anything you'd like to say um, in regards to anything. There's not going to be enough farmers for what's coming up. There's not going to be enough people who know uh, how to feed the soil, you know, how to feed the fungi, and how to get water, and, and how to survive, you know. My suggestion. Uh, uh, is number one, find ways to uh, take care of yourself, but also realize that uh, this uh, life is not anything to be hoarded. It's just beautiful while we're here, like a, a cedar tree. They can live only 10 years, but it's contributed its leaves as medicine to natives. Uh, it's been a, a, a contributive oxygen, it's drawn in CO2. It's uh, contributed sugars to the soils and the fungi, and then it's uh, been a, a host for our communities, you know. So 10 years as a cedar, you know, it might be a young life, you know, but it lived a beautiful, full life as a cedar. Life is precious, you know, every day, you know, and that uh, everyone is precious. Don't ever let anyone tell you that or judge you, you know, because all fear, doubts, and insecurities were given to you by someone else. Us natives, so they have the original sin. We have inherent beauty, you know, because we are all held by the Creator ones. We're all sacred beings. And when people are ready to say, I want to join that guild, I want to learn that craft, then they, they do just as, as, you know, people have done for thousands of years and were required by their grandmothers to do 8,000 years ago. <laughs> Sit down, figure it out, and when you find your passion, mm -hmm. when you, you go, I see how that works. Mm -hmm. oh, let me try that. Let me do that. Wow. I'm part of it. Mm -hmm. That's all it takes. No machinery, no politics, no. just a place for people to be safe with each other.
Oh, thank you guys so much. Let's go, yeah, let's go check it out. <laughs> These findings reinforce the argument that the recognition of flora as a conscious life we have an interdependent relationship with aligns with sustainable action, as all participants either work in sustainable fields or revere a tradition of deep ecology, in which climate regeneration and sustainability for the benefit of life itself is prioritized, regardless of its utility to human needs. These realities imply that one's relation to their natural world provides insight on what may dictate their treatment of the environment, as this relation involves differing levels of consideration, respect, and even reverence of a sacred nature. These findings provide context which emphasizes the importance of protecting and regenerating our environment for all of life. I feel grateful to have been involved in these discussions, but what presented itself as most rewarding was what I learned from the participants in regards to knowledge. Knowledge, traditional knowledge especially, is a gift that may be shared by those it originates from and acts as an example of a way to view the space we inhabit, but can never be owned nor can it be fully understood and experienced by those it does not originate from, as it can only be explained to its fullest extent in the native tongue. And it is also simply a feeling, passed through generations of the native heritage. We must pay attention to our own roots and look into ourselves to truly find this earth-based connection and divinity that is innate in all beings.